Tokyo, the city of neon lights, endless energy, and a heartbeat that never slows down. But beneath the surface of this vibrant metropolis, a chilling darkness lurks. In May of 2012, the city's bustling rhythm was shattered by a shocking and tragic event that left a sickening mark on both Japan and Ireland, ending in an innocent woman losing her life. This is not just a tale of crime. It's a story of loss, justice, and the quest for truth in the face of unspeakable tragedy. Nicola Furlong was born on December 17, 1990, to her parents Andrew and Angela, in a picturesque village in County Wexford, Ireland. Nicola had two younger sisters, Andrea, who was three years younger, and Hannah, who was nine years younger, and she was close to both of them. Growing up in a close-knit community in Wexford, Ireland, Nicola was known for her bright smile, warm, stunning, and generous personality, and had an infectious zest for life. From an early age, Nicola showed a passion for music and sports. She played the piano beautifully and was an avid athlete, often seen playing soccer and running in local competitions. Nicola's dedication and hard work extended to her studies as well. She excelled academically and was determined to make the most of every opportunity that came her way. After graduating from high school in Ireland, Nicola enrolled as a student at Dublin University to pursue a degree in international business and language. But when an opportunity came up to continue her studies abroad, her father Andrew suggested she go, specifically to Japan, since she enjoyed taking the course so much. Her love for exploring new cultures and languages led her to take up an exchange program in Tokyo's Takasaki City University of Economics back in 2011. This opportunity was a dream come true for Nicola, combining her academic ambitions with her love for travel and new experiences. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and she just had to take it, even though it meant being away from her family and friends and her boyfriend for a full year. Tokyo was a huge adjustment, one that Nicola may have underestimated. At first, she struggled to find her way living in Japan. The area she was living in was about two hours away from Tokyo, which is stunning in terms of its beauty, but being outside of a major city means that it offers a more traditional Japanese lifestyle meaning many people don't speak English like they may in a more modernized area like Tokyo. Beyond that, the time Nicola spent missing her family overshadowed much of her experience in Japan. While she enjoyed spending time in Japan, she was mostly just looking forward to finishing up her year in the exchange program and getting back home to her family. Nicola eventually adapted to her new surroundings, making friends and immersing herself in the vibrant Japanese culture. She was known by the locals to be kind-hearted and approachable. Nicola was more than just a student. She was a young woman with a bright future ahead of her. Her love for music continued in Tokyo as well, where she often attended concerts and enjoyed exploring the local music scene. Her weekends were filled with adventures, from visiting historic temples to trying new foods, and she often documented her experiences in a blog that kept her friends and family back home updated on her journey. But Nicola would make one final blog post before her future changed forever. And that's because in the blink of an eye, everything Nicola had worked so hard to build, all the relationships she'd formed in Japan, the memories she had with new friends and new family, they would all vanish in the blink of an eye, when Nicola unexpectedly had her life stolen. In May of 2012, Nicola was just a couple of months away from returning home to Ireland. On the night of May 23rd, 2012, Nicola and her friend, another girl from Ireland who's not been identified, decided to attend a Nicki Minaj concert in Tokyo. It was supposed to be a fun night out with friends, an escape from their busy college schedules. But little did they know that this night would take a dark and sinister turn. Nicola and her friend traveled to Tokyo by train, and it was about a two-hour trip. The plan was to go to the concert and then spend the rest of the night visiting bars in the Tokyo area, catching the first train back to school the next morning. But while they were looking at a transit map and making plans, they were approached by two American men, 19-year-old Richard Hines and 23-year-old James Blackston. The men explained to the ladies that they were visiting Japan from the States, striking up a conversation. While the girls had no idea who these men were and didn't show too much interest in them at first, they were probably just happy to have met someone who could speak fluent English. Richard was from Memphis, Tennessee, and he was there working as a professional musician, 
while James flew in from LA and was there as a professional dancer. The men appeared super friendly, and because they were familiar with the nightlife of the city, they offered to help the young women find their way around. Nicola and her friend thought they seemed friendly enough, so they agreed. The four of them eventually took off in a taxi together. As they were riding around town, Richard and James let the two ladies know that they had two rooms booked and paid for at the Keio Plaza Hotel in the Shinjuku district, an area known for its vibrant nightlife. The men offered to let the girls have one of the rooms for the night, free of charge. But Nicola and her friend declined, saying that they'd be fine to just stay up and take the train back in the morning. The thing is, unbeknownst to the girls, the Shinjuku district, while famous for its nightlife, also has a dark side. Amidst its neon-lit streets and bustling entertainment hubs, this was an area known for its seedier elements, with a much higher crime rate than the rest of Japan. While the girls were just happy to have made a couple of new friends, they had no idea about the twist of fate they were about to walk right into. As the group made it to Shibuya, they decided to visit the Scramble Bar. Nicola and her friend bought the first round of drinks, and Richard and James bought the second round, which was shots of tequila. But Nicola's friend reported that the shot of tequila hit her differently than usual. One minute she was sitting there enjoying drinks and conversation, and the next minute she blacked out. This is where the events of the evening become somewhat of a blur. But just before 1am, security footage from a taxi showed Richard and James putting the two heavily intoxicated women into the back of a car before getting in and telling the driver to take them to Keio Plaza Hotel in Shinjuku, about a 10 or 15 minute drive away. Once they arrived at the hotel, things took a turn for the worst. Nicola and her friend were separated, each going to different rooms with one of the men. It's believed at this point both women were still completely powerless against these men, and they didn't really even have a full understanding of what was going on. The lobby of the Keio Plaza Hotel has, for years, been a symbol of Tokyo's prosperity and openness, where tourists mix with local travelers on their way up to the Twin Towers overlooking the city center. But as the night of May 23rd turned into the early hours of May 24th, the vibrant energy of Tokyo's Shinjuku district began to fade. In a hotel room high above the bustling streets, an unthinkable crime was unfolding. Nicola Furlong, a bright and adventurous young woman, had unknowingly stepped into a nightmare. It was around 12.50 a.m. when the men, alongside Nicola and her friend, arrived at the hotel. Security footage revealed that Richard and James clearly understood just how intoxicated Nicola and her friend truly were. In fact, in this footage, the men can be heard taunting the girls, laughing and gloating about what they planned to do to them when they got them back to their hotel rooms. When the taxi arrived at the hotel, the girls were so far gone they couldn't even walk. The men ended up having to ask hotel staff for two wheelchairs so that they could take the girls up to the rooms. The hotel workers happily obliged without so much as a second thought. Thus, these girls were wheeled away by these two men, with neither of the girls knowing that, for one of them, this night would be their last. In the bizarre security footage, we can see the girls being wheeled away completely against their will. Richard was in control of Nicola, while her friend was being wheeled away by James. At approximately 3.20 a.m., a noise complaint was called in and the hotel manager on duty went to room 1427, the room where Richard was staying, to see what was going on. He knocked on the door a couple of times, but when no one answered, the manager entered the hotel room and discovered Nicola lying face down on the floor. It was clear something had gone horribly, horribly wrong. Emergency services were then called to transport both Nicola and her friend, who was found in the other room, to a nearby hospital. But despite the best efforts of medical professionals, Nicola never regained consciousness. Shortly after 3.55 a.m., it was announced that Nicola was gone. The initial cause of her passing was unclear, leaving her family and friends in a state of shock and grief. After all, she'd just spoken with her friends and family about how happy she was to be attending the concert that evening. She was over the moon about it. How, in such a short span of a few hours, could things have gone this badly? Thankfully, it wasn't difficult for the police to track down who had done this to these two young ladies. After all, the hotel rooms were registered under the names of Richard Hines and James Blackston, the two American men who they'd been at the bar with that night. The men were very quickly tracked down, with both of them being arrested and taken in for questioning. At first, the men were not charged with taking Nicola's life. 
they were merely charged with assaulting the one woman in the back seat of the taxi that they'd taken earlier that night. Police had strong suspicions that both women had been dosed before they fell unconscious, but at this point this was merely a theory. A toxicology sample was taken from Nicola, and investigators were waiting on the results of this analysis before placing any more serious charges against the two men. While this was being carried out, an autopsy was being conducted on Nicola to determine specifically how she lost her life. These results wouldn't come back until the 15th of June, and they were surprising to put it lightly. Professor Kenichi Yoshida carried out the autopsy and reported back that Nicola had not overdosed. Instead, she had her breathing restricted, most likely with an object, something soft like a towel. It was added that Nicola likely didn't lose her life quickly, and it most likely took several minutes and great amounts of distress, which likely lended to the noise complaint that was called in by the other hotel patrons. Now that the police had determined exactly how Nicola had lost her life, they were ready to step the investigation up a notch, and they officially placed first-degree charges against both James and Richard. The crime sent shockwaves through both Japan and Ireland. Nicola's family, devastated by the loss, demanded justice for their beloved daughter. Her mother Angela and father Andrew traveled to Tokyo, enduring the painful process of dealing with their daughter's passing in a distant and unfamiliar country. They sought answers and accountability, hoping that the Japanese legal system would deliver justice for Nicola. Thankfully, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police responded quickly, treating the case with the seriousness that it demanded. They gathered evidence, sent in security footage for forensic analysis, and carefully pieced together the events of that fateful night. The hotel room was thoroughly searched, revealing clues that pointed directly to Hines and Blackston. But the case wouldn't be so simple. These men, though clearly responsible, were not going down without a fight. On the night that Nicola lost her life, detectives say that Richard's actions were most likely driven by a mixture of intoxication and simple aggression. Having grown up in a very rough home environment, Richard had a lot of hatred and resentment towards others. As the investigation revealed, he'd grabbed a hold of Nicola in a fit of rage, an act of unthinkable violence that left her family and friends in utter devastation. What specifically caused him to fly off the handle is still a matter of debate. We don't know if Nicola may have said something that triggered him, or if he was already acting violently before even getting Nicola to the hotel room. But whatever the case, Nicola received the brunt of his aggression and paid dearly for it. While all of this was unfolding, James was in the other room having his way with Nicola's friend. Richard Hines would deny purposefully claiming Nicola's life. He claims that their actions that night were completely consensual, but that things got out of hand when Nicola lost her life as a result. He insists that whatever happened to Nicola, it was an accident. But police were not buying this. As the case went to trial in March of 2013, even more details emerged that admittedly didn't really make the situation any better, and they merely confirmed investigators' darkest suspicions. The prosecution alleged that on the night in question, Hines and Blackston dosed Nicola and her friend without their knowledge, intending to bring them back to their hotel rooms against their will. This much has basically been confirmed. But according to Professor Yoshida, who performed Nicola's autopsy, Nicola had scratch marks on her neck, indicating that she'd tried to fight back against her attacker and likely did so for quite some time. Yoshida says that the method used to claim Nicola's life, it was monstrous. This man would have had multiple minutes to just stand there staring into the eyes of his victim as she fought back, desperately clinging to life. It was brutal, utterly brutal. This was not something that could have in any way been an accident. Nicola's friend was called to testify during the trial, and she did her best to piece together the events of that evening, leading up to the shot of tequila that caused her to pass out. She spoke of how the men offered to take the girls back to their hotel rooms, but that both of the girls declined, as they were in committed relationships. The men acted as if they were going to back off, but they never did. This is when the tequila came out, and Nicola's friend says she lost consciousness just minutes after taking the shot. She has no memory of what happened after this, and the next thing she knows is waking up in a hospital bed. The defense team painted Richard Hines as an honest and decent man who simply wanted to help these two young ladies get to a safe space, like their hotel room, so that they could sleep off the effects of the alcohol they'd been drinking. But investigators were able to dig up CCTV footage from the cab ride to the hotel, 
in which the men could be heard excitedly shouting about how these girls had, quote, fallen into their lap. As they were looking at the two women and chatting about what they were going to do to them, they even bumped fists with one another. This was by no means any sort of accident. This was calculated and planned down to the finest of details. Worse yet, as investigators continued digging into these two men's pasts, they found out this was not the first time that James had been pinned for a crime just like this. In fact, less than a month before Nicola lost her life, James was accused by another woman of spiking her drink and taking advantage of her. When Richard was given a chance to defend himself, he painted Nicola as nothing more than a bar hopper who was looking for someone who could easily get her drunk. He basically suggested that she left her school that night with every intention of getting blackout drunk and suggested that she was willing to set up shop with whoever would get her the drunkest the quickest. I don't think you need me to tell you that this could not have been further from the truth. For me, I think the most heartbreaking part of this entire trial was when the prosecution showed the footage from the hotel lobby. These two girls were desperate for someone to step up, literally anyone to help them out of this bad situation they found themselves in. But not one single hotel worker bothered to ask these girls if they were okay. No one stepped up and said, hey, uh, maybe we should call somebody because these girls are clearly too drunk to even know what's going on. Not one person offered any assistance. They just got them in the wheelchairs they requested and even went as far as to help load the girls into the wheelchairs. It's just sickening and I, I can't wrap my head around it. It just truly blows my mind. Nicola's family was present at the trial and they had to sit through all of the awful retellings of what happened to their daughter. They would deliver a victim impact statement in which they requested the judge hand down the gravest possible punishment. But unfortunately for them, the punishment that this man would receive would be little more than a slap on the wrist. See, at this point in Japan's history, Richard, who was 19, was still considered a minor. The problem is that minors cannot be legally sentenced to the same level of punishment as adults. While these laws have changed in more recent years, that really doesn't matter in Richard's case because in the end, he was found guilty, but he could only be sentenced to a maximum of five to 10 years in prison. And he's now a free man. As for his partner in crime, James Blackston, well, he was convicted of assaulting Nicola's friend, but his sentence was even lighter. He was sentenced to three years of hard labor being released in 2015. He then returned to the United States and continued his career as a dancer, with his crimes in Japan being little more than a footnote in an otherwise great life. These two men have proven themselves to be serial criminals, and they just got away with it. In the years following Nicola's passing, her family has worked tirelessly to honor her memory, creating scholarships in her name and advocating for the safety of young travelers abroad. In the wake of this tragedy, there has been some positive changes aimed at preventing similar incidents in the future. Awareness campaigns about travel safety, particularly for young women abroad, have gained traction among students in the Tokyo area. Hotels in Tokyo and other major cities have implemented stricter security measures to protect their guests, hoping to prevent situations like this from ever unfolding again. These steps, while small, do represent a collective effort to ensure that no family has to endure the pain that Nicola's family has suffered. Not to mention the pain that her friend now has to live with on a daily basis. Nicola's family has shown incredible courage in sharing their story, hoping that Nicola's experience will serve as a warning and a lesson to others. They continue to celebrate Nicola's life, remembering her for the vibrant, loving, and talented young woman that she was. At the end of this story, we're left with just one main takeaway. Justice was served, but sometimes that's simply not enough. These two men should have spent the rest of their lives paying for what they did to these girls. But instead, they're out there living their best life while Nicola's family is left in shambles, and her friend is left to sift through the ashes of the life that she once knew. For both of these families, every semblance of safety and security was ripped clean out of their hands. They will never know true peace again. But for the two men who forced this fate on these women, they just get to move on with their lives and act like the whole thing never happened. And somehow we're supposed to accept this as some form of justice? I don't think so. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. 
If you like this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new cases long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.